Double Jeopardy is an American crime thriller film released in the year 1999. The plot of the film follows a woman named Libby Parsons who is framed for the murder of her husband. Spending six years in prison, the desires that kept her going were to reunite with her son and to resolve the mystery of her dead husband. After she's released on parole, she sets out on a quest to find her son and the truth about the murder under the watch of the cold-hearted parole officer. The film starts with a mother-son duo sitting by the side of the shore and enjoying fishing on Whidbey Island, Washington. Seeing a boat sailing nearby, the mother named Elizabeth Parsons, aka Libby, tells her son Maddie that she will teach him sailing one day as it's even more fun than fishing. She then wishes that Maddie never grows up or else he'll find a beautiful girl and sail away with her. The scene cuts to a grand party hosted by the wealthy Parsons. Libby's husband, Nicholas Parsons, aka Nick, is seen asking his friend if he has also received a letter from the first marshals. His friend assures him not to worry as the letter has no grounds to stand. During the party, Libby's close friend, Angela Green, takes care of Maddie so Libby can attend to the guests. Nick then addresses the guests to raise money for the welfare of a school. After the party, Libby and Nick spend some time together on the porch. However, Angela interrupts them after which Nick decides to surprise Libby with something he and Angela plan for her. He shows her a beautiful expensive boat that he bought so they can spend a weekend sailing. Libby is touched by the surprise as she loves sailing. When she expresses concern for Maddie, Angela offers to look after him so Nick and Libby can enjoy their romantic getaway. On the boat, the two of them make out and have a heartfelt conversation. Libby falls asleep and wakes up in the middle of the night covered in blood. Not only is her robe covered in blood, but the entire boat has splashes of blood everywhere. Devastated, she keeps calling Nick but finds him missing. She then finds a bloody knife on the deck and picks it up. At the same time, the Coast Guard arrives and sees her holding a knife. Libby is escorted to the shore and a search team sets out to find Nick. Waiting for his survival news all morning, Libby loses her wits when the Coast Guard informs her that neither Nick nor his body is found. She spends a few days at her house with Maddie, hopeful that Nick will return, but to no avail. Soon, after Nick is officially declared dead, Libby is formally charged with his murder and arrested. Her attorney, Bobby, informs her that the judge denied her bail. Bewildered, she tells Bobby that although she had some wine that night, she could have never killed her husband. Bobby tells her that since Nick bought his life insurance four months ago worth $2 million, the judge is going to assume it as her motive to kill Nick. Moreover, the fact that Nick was being sued for two of his investors for embezzlement was known to Libby which is why it can be assumed that she killed her husband to get away with the mess and secure the life insurance policy all to herself. Libby is disgusted by the allegations and assures Bobby that she had nothing to do with the murder. In the court, the prosecutor plays the audio of Nick in which he contacted the Coast Guard moments before his disappearance, saying that he is stabbed. Libby begs the jury that she's innocent, but she's convicted of murder. Before going away to prison, she asks Angela to adopt Maddie so he can grow in the right state of mind while she's in prison. Before bidding farewell to her son, she promises him that they will be together again. In contrast to the luxuries she was used to, Libby spends prison time sleeping in wards and cleaning dirty washrooms. Angela brings Maddie to visit his mother once in a while, but she soon stops visiting. Desperate to talk to her child, Libby keeps calling her but she disappears. At night, she cries remembering her child and is heard by her inmates. The next morning, her inmates advise her to think of a way to track down her friend and son. Libby comes up with an idea and calls Maddie's school, tricking the receptionist to reveal Angela's address. She finds out that Angela has been living in San Francisco and tries to get in contact with her. Angela is surprised to receive a phone call from her and claims that she was planning to come next week to see her. Furious, Libby does not believe her and asks her to put Maddie on the phone. While Maddie speaks to Libby on the phone, Nick enters the room and Maddie yells, Daddy. Nick quickly pulls off the phone's plug but Libby understands that Nick faked his death and framed her. Filled with anger, hate, and confusion, Libby spends the entire night awake. The following morning, she calls Nick's life insurance company telling them to investigate Nick as he faked his death but to no avail. Seeing her disturbed, her fellow inmate suggests that she complete her sentence and once freed, she can kill Nick with freedom due to the double jeopardy clause in the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution, which says that no one can get jailed for the same crime twice. 
This motivates Libby, and she starts spending time in the prison with the burning desire of meeting her son and getting revenge on her husband. Within a few months, she grows close to her fellow inmates who cheer her up by celebrating Maddie's birthday. After spending six years in prison, her friends advised Libby to get paroled for good behavior by falsely admitting that she killed her husband and now has become a changed person. Libby does as her friends suggested, and as a result, she's granted conditional parole to a halfway house for the next three years under the supervision of a cynical parole officer, Travis Lehman. He explains the rules to Libby, warning her that if she so much as breaks curfew, she will be sent back to prison to complete the rest of her sentence. The next day, Libby goes to a library and hopes to find Angela's address. She finds a young boy there trying to hit on her. However, when Libby tells him that she was convicted of murder, he bolts. Libby finds a list of Angela Greens and is confused about who she should track. She returns to the halfway house and witnesses Travis sending a paroled woman back to prison for breaking the rule. Seeing his cold-hearted behavior, Libby asks her fellows the reason for it, and it turns out that Travis is a former law professor whose wife and daughter abandoned him due to his drinking problem. Desperate to see her son after six years, Libby goes to her friend, requesting her to give her Angela's address, but she refuses. Seeing no other option, Libby breaks into Maddie's old school on Whidbey Island to get Angela's records. Meanwhile, Travis notices that she's missing and has violated the curfew. The police find out that someone broke into the school. The officers arrive there and try to catch Libby, but she runs away to the beach. After a long chase, they manage to catch her and handcuff her to the jail. Travis arrives at Whidbey Island and takes back Libby to prison through a car ferry. To make sure she doesn't run away, he handcuffs her to his car's door handle and he goes to eat. Seeing her chance of meeting her son slip away, Libby manages to start the car and hits another car in front of her, throwing it in the water. Travis sees her struggling to get away so he rushes to stop her, but before that could happen, Libby drives his car off the ferry. As they sink into the water, Travis uncuffs her so they can resurface. Libby grabs his gun and tries to run away. When Travis tries to take a hold of her, she slams the gun on his head, leaving him to bleed. While Libby swims the opposite way, the paramedics rescue Travis and treat his wound. Meanwhile, Libby takes a lift and arrives at her mother's farm who gives her some cash and her truck. She goes to a car showroom posing as Angela Greens to buy a car. When the manager asks for her social security number, she tells him Angela's social security number and smartly finds out that she lives in Colorado. On the other hand, Travis realizes that he can find Libby near Angela, so he tracks down her address via her social security number that he found in Libby's pocket earlier. Libby arrives at Angela's address, but finds another family living at the house. She asks the lady next door about her, who reveals that Angela died three years ago in a natural gas explosion. Puzzled, Libby digs out the newspaper that covered Angela's death story. After looking at Angela's picture in the newspaper for a long time, Libby finally notices a painting by Kardinsky in the background that was owned by Nick. She goes to an art gallery to find out who bought the painting. She finds the name Jonathan Devereaux with an address of New Orleans. Just then, Travis arrives at the art gallery after he finds a truck parked outside it. However, when he enters the gallery and tries to catch her, Libby runs away, and before leaving, she manages to destroy Travis's car so he does not follow her. Determined to meet her son, she arrives in New Orleans where she discovers that Nick owns a luxury hotel under the name of Jonathan Devereaux. She asks the hotel's receptionist about him and finds out that he will be hosting an auction party at night. To attend the party, Libby goes to an expensive boutique and poses as someone else to get a dress for the evening. Meanwhile, Travis arrives in New Orleans to track Libby down. He seeks help from the police after informing them that one of their residents' life is at risk. On the other hand, Libby smartly infiltrates the party and reveals herself to Nick during the fundraising auction. Nick is stunned to see her and suggests discussing their matter personally. However, Libby thinks otherwise and starts insulting him in front of the guests. She asks him how long he and Angela had been planning together to get rid of her. Nick tells her that he faked his death to escape the charges of embezzlement and provide her and Maddie with the insurance money. When Libby asks him about Angela, he tells her that he had nothing to do with her death. Libby refuses to believe his words and demands he returns Maddie to her. Travis arrives at the party and shows Nick, aka Jonathan, Libby's photograph, alerting him that the woman is dangerous, but Nick denies recognizing her. Meanwhile, the police spread Libby's wanted posters all across the city. A police officer spots her walking in the street and informs the station about it. 
Travis rushes to the location but fails to find her. The following morning, he goes to meet Jonathan in his office and notices the Kardinsky artwork that Libby was searching for in the art gallery. Libby then calls Nick and asks him to bring Maddie to Lafayette Cemetery No. 3. Nick agrees to bring Maddie at 4 p.m. Both of them arrive at the cemetery on time and Nick tells her that Maddie is inside the cemetery and is scared to meet her. Libby goes inside and finds a boy standing at a distance. As she approaches him, he starts walking away from her, luring Libby to a tomb. Nick appears from behind, slams Libby's head on a pillar, and locks her in a coffin. Meanwhile, Travis tries to find records of Jonathan Devereaux but fails to get anything. Nick, on the other hand, pays the boy he hired to set Libby up and leaves the cemetery. Finding Nick shady, Travis tells his boss in Washington State to fax him the driver's license for Nicholas Parsons. Meanwhile, in the coffin, Libby uses a lighter and is devastated to find a corpse next to her. Helpless, she grabs Travis's gun and shoots the hinges off the coffin to get out. Once out, she escapes the tomb by smashing the window open with a pot. Travis finds Nick's driver's license, but it has someone else's picture on it. Soon enough, he finds Libby entering Jonathan's hotel. But before she could enter, he catches her. Overwhelmed, Libby breaks into tears seeing him. In the evening, Travis meets Nick at his hotel and at first apologizes to him for doubting his identity. He then reveals that he found six Nicholas Parsons in Washington and that the third of them had his picture on it. Realizing that his identity had been leaked, Nick makes a deal with Travis to give him $1 million and confesses that he murdered Libby. But to his surprise, Libby enters the room with a gun pointed at him. When Nick tries to warn her about the charges of murder, she tells him that she can kill him with liberty because of the double jeopardy rule. Startled, Nick reveals the address of Maddie's boarding school in Georgia and asks her to leave him alone. Libby shoots Kardinsky's painting in the background instead of shooting Nick. She reveals that she does not want to give him an easy death but instead wants him to suffer in prison as she did. Travis then plays taped confession of Nick in which he admitted to murdering Libby. This infuriates Nick and he pulls his gun and shoots Travis in the shoulder. He then approaches Libby to shoot her but Travis pushes him down. Nick overpowers Travis and when he's about to shoot him again, Libby grabs her gun and shoots Nick multiple times. Soon, the paramedics arrive and treat Travis's wound. When Libby demands freedom, Travis insists on taking her back to Washington to win her pardon and parole. Later, Travis drives her to the boarding school in Georgia. Before entering, Libby feels scared that her son won't recognize her but Travis encourages her to do what she wanted to do all along. The film ends with Libby reuniting with her son who recognizes her instantly. This movie has a rating of 6.5 on IMDb. The budget of this movie was around $70 million and at the box office, it earned $177.8 million. I hope you all liked this video. If yes, then make sure to like, comment, and most importantly, subscribe to the channel for more movie recaps.